Okay, so chapter six again is is all about metabolism and how you take food sources and break them down into energy. Um, a couple of terms that you need to know. First off, catabolic means basically to release energy to, by breaking down, whereas anabolic means using energy by building. So these are um, what's called antonyms, right? Catabolic means to break down, and then anabolic, you're actually using the energy to start building up. Um, so if you're doing a process, and that process you're breaking down, say, like glucose, and there's a carbon-based sugar, and you're breaking it down and releasing the energy bonds, that's going to be a catabolic process. If you're then taking that energy... If you're then taking that energy um, and you are building subs, substances, then that's anabolic. Okay, remember, what's, what's kinetic energy? Move, move, move. Moving energy. Okay, whereas potential energy is stay stored energy. Now, in physics, we say it's staying in one spot, right? We have gravitational potential energy because it's up high and so it has gravitational potential energy. But in biology, what are we talking about that's potential energy? Fats, okay. Yeah, fats are stored energy. What else is potential energy? Sorry. The, the height? Okay, so it's not moving. What do we, so we, so how do we get the carbohydrates, or sorry, not the carbohydrates, but the, 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 car, the hydrocarbons into fats? If we don't, if we eat a lot of sugar, we get energy, right? Okay, so if I sit there, but if I sit on, on the couch and I'm eating my candy bar and I just sit on the couch and eat drinking my Coke and eat my candy bar and eat my hot fries, is that carbohydrates going to be able to be broken down? No, what's it going to be turned into? Back to the fats, right? So our body stores energy in the form of fats. It also stores it in the form of, of glycogen in your liver. Okay? Um, same thing on the plants. The plants, again, also store energy, um, but they store energy in the form of starch. Now, the laws of thermodynamics. Um, you remember these? A little bit. Remember, there's basically, uh, there's basically four laws of thermodynamics, but it goes 0, 1, 2, and 3, because that makes sense. Um, the ones you really specifically need to know on here is, are these open? Here. Are these? Um, first off, the second law, you can't see that cutting, can you? Law number two. So you mean zero, one, two. Yeah, so it goes zero, one, two. So the second law is the law of entropy. Entropy. Yeah, I know. So the second law is the law of entropy. Um, and basically what the law of entropy says is that um, uh, biological systems, any kind of system, will go from a state of, of order to a state of disorder. And entropy is basically the measurement of disorder. So if, if you look at your body, okay, you eat that Snickers bar. That Snickers bar is loaded with, with, with peanuts and caramel and chocolate and all that good stuff, right? That's a very ordered structure. But then as your body breaks it down, that order slowly starts slowing or starts breaking down. It actually goes into a state of entropy. So naturally, everything goes towards a state of entropy. The world itself is actually going towards a state of entropy, okay? That's, that's that whole idea that um, the law, of the thermodynamics is where they, they kind of base this idea of Big Bang Theory off of, um, where at one time the world actually, or everything that was inside the universe actually came together into a complete state of order, and that state of order then broke into chaos, into this entropy state, okay? So on biology, we look at entropy as far as we're going from a ordered structure, say of a carbon chain, to a disordered structure of a bunch of little small carbons that we use for energy. Okay. The um, the first law of thermodynamics, the law number one, basically says that the energy in a system, so all the energy in this room, will not be lost or gained, or is maintained. So that's a, that, uh, the, the, also known as the law of conservation of energy. If the energy um, that you put into a system has to be the same energy you get out of it. So if you eat 200 calories of 
Fruit Loops, your body is going to, that 200 calories had to come from somewhere, from an, uh, a system. Most of them, the earth, like the, what, Fruit Loops are corn? I don't know what they are. The Fruit Loops. From the Fruit Loop plant. Okay, so the 200 calories came from the Fruit Loop plant. You then take those 200 calories and then you break those down and you convert them into either heat or you can convert them into other processes that you use in your body. Okay? But none of the energy is actually being lost. So especially if you're in chemistry, you need to always look at what, where is the energy coming from and where is the energy going to. Okay? Um, same thing here. Where is the energy coming from when we look at the enzymes and the, the, the protein, or sorry, the, the, um, the peroxide is going to start breaking down the yeast. The energy that's breaking that down, where is that energy coming from, and where is it going to? Okay. And basically, if you know those two, that's, that's essentially how law of thermodynamics works together. Yeah. What were the laws called? These are all called laws of thermodynamics. Oh. And so that's, that's kind of like what this picture is talking about. Basically, the, the, um, the gas which you put into your gas tank, okay, that's actually it would be a catabolic process. But then the anabolic process is actually using the energy to build essentially the exhaust, but the burning sensation, or the burning to allow the car to go. Now, um, this is best explained by this. Okay, If you look at a graph, and the graph looks something like this, and this is energy. Energy, E. Energy is going up. And this is time. If you start this way, if you start with a very high energy, it goes up and then goes down, okay, is the energy increasing or decreasing from where it started? So here's the reactants and here's the products. The energy is decreasing. So that means the energy is going out, right? Yeah, so it would be, and, and actually, and so it would, be, it would be an exothermic reaction, but we call it. It's basically the same thing. It's called exergonic reaction. Okay. Oh, that's an R. So reactants and products. But if we look at endergonic, endergonic is going to look something like this. Again, we have energy. And we have time. This time, the reactant is going to start down here, and it's going to go up. Out. Okay. So again, these are the, this is the reactants. And this is the products. The products have more energy than the reactants do, so it's known as endergonic because the energy actually is going into the product. Okay. And again, this this exergonic would be a catab catabolic. Uh, reaction is endergonic will be anabolic meaning the energy is being brought in to build something so what are examples for either? so okay so the, the, the exergonic would be things like so we're, we're releasing energy so things like um, respiration so cellular respiration is an exergonic reaction meaning that you're taking the, the, the glucose that you ate from the plant and you're breaking down to form energy, whereas photosynthesis is the opposite. Photosynthesis actually takes the energy, so it's anabolic, and it actually takes the energy from the sun, and it builds glucose. So the energy of the sun is right here, right? So this is the sun's energy, and then it stores it up into glucose, right? Whereas this would be, um, there's the energy from the sun that's stored in the plant, and then it goes and it breaks down into energy released. So, okay, so free energy is the energy that's available for use. Okay? It's done as, it's, when you're in chemistry, it's that, that Gibbs constant. Have y'all talked to that yet? What? The Gibbs, the delta that. G. We haven't used it. So, yeah, and so basically what free energy is, the, the energy that's available for use. Um, and what it means with free energy in equilibrium is that the energy that you use has to be the same energy that's being put into it. And again, it's that whole first law of thermodynamics. It's the energy that's saved. The energy, that's you, the energy cannot be created or destroyed. It has to only be transferred. So the free energy that's available, it can only go from, from one source to another. 
is not ever really being lost. And eventually what happens is it goes to a state of equilibrium to where both the, the reactants and the products have the same amount of energy. Which sounds like it's going against the second law of thermodynamics, which says that it's, it's going to a state of disorder, which means that one side would have more, di more energy. But remember, we're talking about the entire system. So if one state's going to more energy, one state's going to less energy, it will never actually go to that state of equilibrium because of the, the second law. Okay. Late night, good morning. All right. Um, ATP. This is basically like the, the money source for the cell, right? It's the only way that, that we can actually do anything in our cell is through ATP. Now, ATP is ad adenosine triphosphate. Um, if you look at the structure, it's basically you have the the adenosine, which is basically a nucleotide. Okay. It has then all these, and again, that's not the most correct drawing, but, but what you really need to see is this. It's got these little phosphates attached to it. And basically what these phosphates are, are potential energy. Because essentially these are just springs ready to release. And notice that there's three phosphates, so that's why it's triphosphate. So what's the So it's adenosine triphosphate. A-D-E-N-S-I-N-E. And then tri, T-R-I, phosphate. P-H-O-S-P-A-T-E. Okay. So what's the E? Like springs? Or? Yeah, so they're kind of like, they're kind of like, um, did you ever have a, uh, so, yeah, so the regeneration, well, like I was telling Taz, um, so you have ADP, and actually you can even go down to AMP, which is adenosine monophosphate, which basically just says it's got one phosphate. But basically what happens is during a, during a process, and we'll talk the processes next time, or on Chapter 9, which is after this, um, it will then recuperate that phosphate, and it will basically do the cycle over and over again. Okay, and that's why I talk about, that's what I mean by regeneration, is that at some point, the, the adenosine diphosphate gets that phosphate back, and then that phosphate is then ready to be loaded again to be able to use to break down energy. And then it uses the, the phosphate, it goes back to ADP, the ADP is then reloaded with the phosphate, and then it goes back in the cycle. So, where is the phosphate from? Is it the same one? It it's different ones. It's different. Yeah, yeah. And that's where, like, um, that's what I'm saying. That's where, like, on the, like, the phospholipids, that's where a lot of those phosphates come from. Um, it could be other sources, too. Um, you know, those phosphates are like an amino acids, so it could be that as well. Cool. But, um, now, remember, we had this graph. Graph looks something like this. So we have this graph. It goes like this. So there's our graph again. Remember, this is our reactants. This is our products. This point right here, this very top point right here, this is called the activation energy. Okay? And that's the energy of activation. That, at that point the, is, is where the energy is, is good enough to be able to activate the reaction to occur. Okay? And the way I always think about it is, is this. If you take, like, a, you ever lit in a, a, a black hat, right? And if you take that, if you, like, have a lighter, you're, like, you're supposed to use a funk, but if you have a lighter and you bring the, you bring the lighter up to the black cat, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a certain point where the flame is touching the black cat, but the black cat isn't lit yet. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah, like fireworks. But anyways, there's, there's a time where the flame is actually touching the wick. It's the same thing with a candle. There's a time where, like, if you're lighting a candle, you're like, oh, it smells so good, right? And you, like, light the candle. There's a time where the flame is touching the wick, but the wick isn't lit on fire, correct? Yes. Okay. So what had, what's literally is happening is this right here. You give it energy, okay? So you're giving it energy right here. You're giving it energy, giving it energy, giving it energy. It Boom. It sparks. It and then it starts to burn, okay? Oh, That's called the activation energy. Okay. Now, you notice the activation energy on this is pretty high. Well, that's where enzymes come along. If your body has enzymes, so let's say the red line is enzymes, or sorry, is without enzymes. What happens here is basically, 
it does that. So again, this black line, this one right here, is with enzymes. What's, I, mean, I can tell the height. That's the difference. So it, it doesn't work faster. It just works at a lower amount of energy. So it's more efficient? It's more efficient, exactly. Yeah, so enzymes basically make your body more efficient. And enzymes are proteins. And just like how we talked about how proteins can be denatured because of too high heat, because of too salty, because of uh, a wrong pH, it's the same thing on enzymes. They use less energy? Right. It lowers the activation energy so that you have to use less energy. Now, there's, there's a couple terms up here. Catalyst, enzyme, or sorry, um, catalyst is basically in reduces the activation energy, and the way it does that is, is essentially by using an enzyme, and then talks about the substrate specific, okay? Here's what that is. If, if this is your enzyme, okay, you notice it has a very specific shape. Okay, so this is my enzyme. Now, let's say this enzyme is maltase. Okay, and basically what maltase is, is it breaks down the glucose sugar. It breaks down the maltose sugar into glucose and glucose. Okay, so this right here is my enzyme. This right here is my substrate. Okay, so the substrate goes into the enzyme. Now, this part right here is known as the activation or the active site. Okay, and notice that the active site is open right now. So this, this substrate can go into the enzyme's active site, and that enzyme will then break apart the substrate. Okay. Now, if this active site isn't open, say there's already a substrate there, if, that ex if this active site has something in it that's basically blocking the substrate to, from actually attaching to it, it won't work. If it's been denatured, because remember I, I told you that enzymes are proteins, or protein, one of the type... Sorry, proteins are uh, a type of protein would be an enzyme, and just like all proteins, they can be denatured because of heat, salt, and pH. If it's changed in the shape, let's say instead of um, it having a shape like this, it gets denatured and has a shape like that. That substrate won't connect to that enzyme, and so it can't break it down. Okay, and again, the reason why the enzyme's there is to lower the activation energy. Now, let's say that that enzyme fits into there. Because you all can kind of see how, how that would kind of fit in there. But let's say instead of having this being a, a, a um, this is a maltase enzyme, and instead of this being a maltose, let's say this is a galactose. And a galactose, all that is, is basically a, We'll say that's the, that's the other monosaccharide we have here. Now, you notice that now this won't fit into the enzyme. I know it's really, like, really badly drawn, but see how that, that extra bin right there won't fit into there. Okay? So this won't fit into this enzyme here. All right? Okay? So what you'd have to do is you then have to find a lactase enzyme to break down that lactose. That's the reason why there's, always, there's very specific enzymes that break down specific um, polymers. Breaks down lactose, a maltase breaks down the maltose. Like what is that? This would be, so this right here, uh -huh. that would be lactose. And this enzyme only breaks down maltose. So this would be the maltase enzyme, this would be the lactase, and so this isn't able to lock it there. So enzymes specifically break down certain polymers. Polymers, yeah. So that's what it means by substrate specific. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so substrate specific. It's kind of like this, um, so my key opens up my door, right? My key does not open up, say, Miss Queen's door, which she's downstairs, because I have no reason to be in her room, right? So, a, if you're going to do analogies, we all love analogies, right? Okay? And we're going to do this fancy, like, um, we're going to do this the fancy thank you maps way, okay? The substrate 
Okay, remember that subtrace, basically what we break it down, is like the key. Okay? The enzyme is like the lock. And then the activation, or sorry, the active site, the active site is like the keyhole. Okay, and here's what I mean by all that. I take my key and I go across the street and I try to open up Mercedes' door. Is it going to work? No. No. Because I have the wrong substrate to the wrong enzyme. Okay? Now, if someone wants to play a trick on me and take super glue into my key hole, can my key, can my substrate fit into my enzyme? No. no. And that's basically what I talked about how the activation side, the activation side is locked. If it's like jammed up with another substrate, or if it's jammed up because it's been changed because of denaturization, or something like that, my key, my substrate cannot fit into my enzyme, my lock. Okay? And so it's very, very specific. Now, this is the, what, this is like the original model that they kind of put out forth there. They, they put forth there saying this is the way enzymes work. It's just like a lock and a key. But what they found is actually that um, enzymes are movable. And remember, enzymes are just proteins, and proteins are just 3D shapes. And so they can kind of adjust a little bit. And so if a, if a substrate comes on and doesn't exactly fit, it can kind of wedge its way in, and sometimes it'll work. And so it's called, it's, it's, they used to call it the lock and key method. Now they prefer what's called the induced fit method. Induced fit basically means it just forces its way into what fits in right. And the enzyme will then start breaking it down. But if it's not close at all, it's not going right. to fit in there. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, and, and so that's the reason why, like, sometimes you'll see, um, like, enzymes. Someone that is lactose intolerant might be able to break some lactose down um, by, by using another enzyme, say, like, the maltose, en the maltase enzyme, um, because it kind of fits. Because the only difference between um, maltose and lactose is that it's instead of a glucose glucose, it's a glucose galactose. And so that's, I mean, it's, it'll fit one side and it kind of works its way in and sometimes it'll fit the other one. That's why some people can like break down some milk, but they can't break down too much. It's because it's called, it's called an induced fit. And then I've already kind of talked about some of these. Again, the environmental effects, um, the temperature, the pH, these are all the things that we're going to test on the enzyme lab itself. Um, now on the, the, the um, inhibitors, actually, I actually want to show you all a video on that one. Um, there's a really kind of cool animation I want to show you.